Peeps and Creeps and welcome to Fright Club. I'm Gav, he's Danny. Hello. We are the Fright Club NI and this is a brand new episode of Monday Night Frights. On tonight's show we're talking about the 1980s werewolf classic, An American Werewolf in London. Werewolves of London. <laughs> what the hell's going on here? Some kind of animal, sir. <laughs> And we're back with another episode of Monday Night Frights. It's season three, episode 13, the finale. Big finale. Woo. Danny, how have we made it to the finale of three seasons? That's fucking mental. I honestly, you know what? It, it still absolutely blows me away how how far we've come and how dedicated we've been as well. I know. In spite of like a pandemic and having to return to work and everything else. Um, we and also, have... also, we're pretty lazy. So like... <laughs> Yeah, yeah. We normally we normally sort of half arse most of our projects, uh-huh. um, but we have managed to stay pretty true and dedicated to this. But as you can see, we are also joined for our grand finale by resident lycanthrope yes. uh, enthusiast Kit, and also Ginger. But no gingers shall be referenced in this movie. No gingers today. Uh-huh. No. Nope. I don't think there are any. Are there any? Any redheads in this film? I don't think so. There must be. Statistically. There's be, statistically, there must be one redhead. Yes. But no, one background actor. Uh, if anybody knows, let us know in the comments below or on Twitter. Um, is there a background actor of yeah. ginger Des- Descent. <laughs> <laughs> there must be somebody in the pub somewhere in the background. There must oh. be. A wee, uh, I think Rick Mail's a bit ginger. Ginger, ginger yes. We talked yeah. about Rick Mail. Maybe he is a wee bit ginger, yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But anyway, oh, yeah. so, we haven't even said what we're... We're talking about we're talking about American Werewolf in London. Yes, nineteen eighty. Well, that's why classic. That's, that's why Kate's joining us because yes, she is. is the resident lycanthrope expert. Lycanthrope. Mm-hmm. Yes, like and subscribe. Like and subscribe. Like like and th- oh. like and subscribe. Like and subscribe. <laughs> um, yeah. So obviously, Kate, you were on uh, our Ginger Snaps episode f- uh, this a couple of weeks ago at the start of season three, which was brilliant, amazing episode. And um, you're back for another werewolf episode. So, mm-hmm. this is my specialty, guys. This is your I'm specialty, alive. yes. I'm calling life was about werewolves, but I'm so, happy with that. I'm You'll have to join us for vampires because you did mention in the, the Ginger Snaps episode that you are fond of vampire films as well. So, you will have to join us for a vampire one. But for this season, you are the resident leg and throat well, expert. As a little teaser for season four, I have tabled in one of the greatest vampire films of all time. Really? Um, from this same decade, so that gives it away a little bit. But yeah, you're more than welcome to join us for that episode. I think I don't. Is have, it? You to, have you told me this? I don't think you have told me, but I, I'm, mm. I'm trying to think. Does it involve some we've mentioned in the last couple episodes? I'm sure I have. So, uh, I'm sure I have told you. I'm sure I've sent you the list. You've sent me the list. I've yeah, sent you so a couple I'm, of lists. So you sent me a few lists, but no, it's just I was the. When you kind of mentioned just you've name dropped a particular actor the last two episodes, I believe, uh, or at least a little, yeah. Have I? Is it a horror comedy? No, uh, it's not really. Okay, then it's not why I thought it was going to be Vampire in Brooklyn, but no, 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 it's, it's, not, not, it's not that. But one. we could definitely cover Vampire in Brooklyn Eddie! if you want to hear us cover. <laughs> if you want to hear us cover Vampire in Brooklyn, let us know in the comments below. Kate, do you want to join us for Vampire in Brooklyn as well? Absolutely. Well, oh, yeah, Danny, <laughs> funny enough, Eddie Murphy was supposed to be in this movie. No, he wasn't really. That was I was going to say, I was like, what? I've never read that. Oh that, would, that would be too weird. He was supposed to be the werewolf. That would be so weird. But no, he wasn't. <laughs> You mean the American crazy. consulate man? Yeah. Like that would be good. <laughs> Coming to oh, American Werewolf in London. <gasps> oh. oh my god, the crossover. How did that not <laughs> happen? <laughs> that should have definitely happened. Like James Earl Jones as a werewolf would be an imposing. Imagine that voice, that yeah. imposing yeah. voice, and then it suddenly comes into an, a big howl. Ooh. Mm. We're on to something here, guys. We're, We're on to something. something. <laughs> but let's get back before we rabble let's on go. for the next hour about Eddie Murphy. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so written and directed by John Landis uh, and released in 1981. He actually wrote this script way back in 1969. And he couldn't. Working on Kelly's Heroes. Yes, that's right. Yes, Danny's yeah. been doing his research too. I also love Kelly's Heroes. Yes. I'm a big I am a big John Landis fan. As much as there is controversy around his being, his character, um, I do enjoy his films. Big fan. Big his films fan. are great. I'm not so much a fan of the person, but his films mm-hmm. are great. Yeah. Um, 
So we may as well start with you, Kate. When did you first see the movie? Again, far too young. Same, same as Ginger Snaps. I messaged my dad earlier because I watched it with him uh, one night, and he said I was about he said I was about eight, but I feel like I was much younger because I definitely watched it before Ginger Snaps because the werewolf seed was already planted at that point when I watched Ginger Snaps. So I'm again must be six or seven, surely. Okay, and obviously you loved it. I loved it. Yeah, yes. even I even remember it having sleepovers in primary school I'd make my friends watch it <laughs> like P6, <Wow>. P7 <laughs> It's going home traumatised and their and parents I... been like, they're not going back to her house no, That's why I don't have any friends <laughs> <laughs> So yeah watched it very young and was obsessed with it um, I think we got the, the DVD immediately after that so I could watch it obsessively I uh, loved the soundtrack, always had the soundtrack on, um, tried to watch the sequel, didn't enjoy so much. Mm. <laughs> I've never seen the sequel. It it is, it's it's not worth looking at, no. It's more of a, spir- well, yeah. mm. yeah. it's more it's of a spiritual of- sequel, it's not really a proper sequel. No, yeah, it's American World in Paris. Yeah. Oh, it's actually, it's on Amazon Prime because when I was looking up, uh, because I rewatched it again today and when I was looking up, uh, it came up as one of the like recommends and it's on Prime right now. For anybody that wishes to watch it, I might go watch out of curiosity. You should. It's, got, it's Julie Delpy. She's. Yeah, she's, she's, yeah, she's an Yeah, amazing. I love her. But it's, I mean, you should watch it just to revel in its just terribleness. Just... Okay. Okay. Yeah. But once was enough for me. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Yeah, Danny, when did you see it then? Um, I think I must have saw it maybe not as young as Kate, but I'm near sure that it was you that introduced it to me, Kate. I'm sure that it was probably you that brought it around to our house or we watched it in your house. Um, because I do remember watching it young. Um, and yeah, just really enjoying I think when you're younger, you kind of watch it and it's scary. Mm-hmm. But as you get older, you realize the the humor in it. There, you know, there's some fantastic, funny moments. And again, it was one of those ones in, in my research. Um, it was it's the American Film Institute. It's on their top 100 comedy lists for American films. Um, and yeah, it, it's something that I think as you get older, you kind of appreciate it more for. Uh, the humour and for the different things that Landis brings to it, you know, even the fact that he's got like Frank Oz and it's like, again, a reoccurring person throughout his films. There's the Muppets, which again, ties into the whole Frank Oz thing and there's just nice wee bits and pieces again, the use of the soundtrack and all that sort of thing. It's very much uh, a Landis film Mm -hmm. Um, but it's his approach on horror, but he obviously also did um, like the thriller video and we kind of see a lot of the werewolf influences um and thriller as well, well it was this film that got him the thriller job because uh-huh. yep. apparently mj was like a massive massive fan of the film and yep. he, he obviously had this idea for doing thriller and he wanted rick beggar to do the effects and he obviously wanted john landis then to direct the, the video and yep. thriller's awesome you know hugely influential but um you were saying that you know it was top one of the top lists in the comedy john landis landis is adamant that this is not a comedy movie Mm-hmm. It's very much a horror film that has some humour in it, and he wanted to lace humour through throughout it, but he didn't want it to ever be called a comedy movie or even a comedy horror, mm-hmm. which is a bit strange because it's like probably it was one of those films that kind of was able to get the right balance between comedy and horror, and mm-hmm. that's why he couldn't make it uh, back in '69 because uh, he couldn't get financing for it because no nobody would give him the money because they didn't know whether it was a comedy or a horror, mm-hmm. and they didn't think it would work being a mixture of both. So he went, he went ahead and made Animal House and, you know, Schlock and uh, Blues Brothers obviously was a massive hit. And then he was able to get the financing to actually make this film. I fucking love Blues Brothers. Oh, For anyone know. that doesn't know, we know, I fucking love Blues Brothers. Um, <laughs> but yeah, John Landis, what I a know. boy. Ah, he's a bit of a cock, to be honest. But anyway, we'll not, <laughs> we'll not go with it. We enjoy his movies. We enjoy his movies. But uh, so... When did you first... Sorry, we haven't actually asked this. you... When did you see the film first? I saw it on... Um, my brother had lots of videotapes hidden away in his room. Uh, they weren't porn or anything. <laughs> they were just horror movies and just like movie, like just things he had taped off MTV and, you know, like bands and Metallica and all that sort of stuff. And I remember going through them one day and finding this and being like, American Werewolf in London. That just sounded like the coolest name ever. 
I think I was probably about 12 or 13. So it wasn't like really young. And I, I had heard of the movie before and I watched it one afternoon. And I wasn't super impressed by it, to be honest with you. Yeah. I thought it was going to be more scarier. I did think it was scary, but um, I suppose at, at that age, I was kind of starting to understand the humour a bit better. You guys were a wee bit younger, so maybe you weren't getting the humour, but I was getting the humour a wee bit more. So I was surprised at how humorous it was. But then whenever I revisited it, sort of a few years later, I really was like, wow, this is amazing. Like, and I really appreciated all the gore and the, the special effects, which, you know, this is the one thing you can take out of this film is that it's got some of the greatest special effects ever put Incredible. on screen. Absolutely. I mean, Rick Becker, like, if his name's attached, it's going to be fantastic, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah, um, it's 40 years old, this mm -hmm. film. Like, that's crazy. Yeah. Still looks amazing. Absolutely amazing. Still better than anything you would, pretty much anything you sort of see today in terms of, you know, computer-generated graphics against actual physical prosthetics. Uh -huh. um, it's so good. Because even when you see, um, when you see Jack, isn't it Jack? Mm -hmm. uh, Jack's his mate, yeah. he gets small. Yeah, aye, yeah. uh, when you see Jack, I was reading up about like the whole, his, you know, the way he gradually starts to sort of decompose, but the mm -hmm. first time we see him is in the hospital. And um, the the room's really, really lit up and really bright, and you can clearly see all the gore and the details and stuff. And normally in movies prior to that, when you saw something like that, it would normally be overcast with shadow and there'd be a lot of kind of implied gore. But with this, Landis was that confident in Rick Becker's work. They was like, look at it all, take it all in, see all those details and stuff in there. Um, he was just that confident and what Rick Becker had done, he was like, no, let's put a big spotlight on this and show everybody. Um, and I thought that was great. I think that just really speaks a lot for um, Rick Becker's work and for the confidence that the people have in him. Mm -hmm. I think whenever he wanted to make it originally, um, one of the things that stopped him from pushing to try to get the finance was the fact that he was like, I don't know how to do this. I don't know. I have a vision, but I don't think this will actually ever happen because he he wasn't sure that you could actually do that on screen. And then he worked with Rick Becker on Schluck in 1971. And he actually spoke to Rick Becker about, you know, 10 years prior to actually making it, he spoke to Rick Becker about, could he potentially do something like this? And he was like, yeah, I could. And obviously it took 10 years to get to that point or well, nine years really. But uh, I mean, fucking hell. What a, what a special effects artist he is. And I love hearing Rick Becker talk about the process and how he came up with the ideas of, oh, we can we could make the, the hair grow out, you know, and reverse it and yeah. um, or pull the hair down and then reverse it to make it look like it's growing. And, you know, the things that he did with the fake head and the snout and all is just mind boggling. It really is mind boggling. Is there anything else that, any other film that came after it that's even sort of, there's a few that are close but again, probably all like super influenced by this. Like so many, I dare say a lot of a lot of practical effects artists and directors and stuff watch this and probably went, "We need to up our game. We yeah. need to we need to meet that standard." There's that. There was definitely like this is definitely the one film that kind of really kicked Hollywood up the arse, and everyone after this really had to up their game. And if you look at films like The Howling, which was out in the same year as this, there is a really cool transformation scene. In that as well but it's it's kind of in shadow a lot of it is in shadow and there's a bit there's a few more cuts i think and um and we interviewed d wallace last year so if you want to want to go back and watch that video you can on her youtube uh, but then she she was obviously saying that you know she she wasn't there when it happened yeah. obviously that was all filmed separately but and then if you look at a film like company of wolves which has got a cool cool scene where the wolf comes out of the guy's mouth like that's that's a real cool trans transformation scene but it was a few years after this, so you know this was the one that really influenced everything that came afterwards. Um, budget time, Danny. Budget time. Give us those figures. Figures Gav. time. Figures time. So it was about five point eight million, just a hefty amount actually for a nineteen eighty one film. Uh, but it made about sixty two million box office, and again, as you know, has went on to become an iconic film and made a lot more money in DVD video sales, Blu-ray sales and different releases and Arrow released one recently and it's got awesome, awesome uh, 
You got it. Have you got your? Are you going to do? I, I, I don't have it here. I do have it. I said, "Hey, me, I didn't have it. I should have left it there, like I did last week with uh, Candyman." But I do have it there, and it's awesome artwork as well. And uh, there's some cool documentaries on there as well. So check out if you haven't already bought that Blu-ray. You should check out. It's available on their website. Uh, so, Danny, you were saying that you did a bit of research and you knew that this was inspired. This was written whenever he was working on Kelly's Heroes. Mm-hmm. So Donner, Donner, uh, Herp, Donald Herp, Herp, Herp. Sutherland yes. was first approached to play David. There you go. Which I was like, mm-hmm. could you imagine Donald Sutherland playing David? I don't know. A wee bit older. Mm-hmm. You know, he'd, he'd already done, you know, like um, quite a quite a lot of big movies. I know he'd done Invasion of the Body Snatchers as well. And he would have looked, uh, what was the other one? Uh, don't Look Now. He's in as well, but I think he would have been too old for the role because they needed to be kind of youngish, didn't they? Yeah, like for that role. Really nice. Yeah, but um, because so, well, they're backpacking, they're backpacking across. They're yeah. planning to go to Europe, isn't it? And they're just kind of going through England as on the way there. But <laughs> as you do, I know. Um, I, I was going to say that it was inspired. The idea, I think, was inspired whenever they were in the old Yugoslavia and they were traveling up and down roads, obviously. And uh, Landis, they had to stop at a crossroads and Landis seen this gang of gypsies who were burying a dead body. It was an actual dead body and they were burying a corpse, but they were burying him feet first. So it wasn't like laying down on the back. They were burying him deep and they were digging the hole and they were, they were putting him down. And he said that he was standing there for about 45 minutes watching all this. And they were, they were basically doing like a ritual where they were protecting his body so the body wouldn't rise again. But it was like that, that sort of Romany gypsy type idea, something that you would have seen in the original Wolfman movie. And he said he, he got the idea about well, what happened, what would happen if the body did rise up, which is whenever he got that idea for the scene where David sees himself in the hospital bed in the forest and the nurse comes around and then he, he opens and it's that famous blue face uh, with the yellow contact scene. So that's kind of the inspiration behind it, which I love. Like I love hearing how everyone gets these ideas in their heads first and then they progress and they, they, they think of the story but I just like like that story so I wanted to share it um, Kate is this your favourite werewolf movie or oh, Ginger, yeah. Ginger Snaps yeah. definitely this one definitely definitely good yeah. stuff nice one I think it's probably <laughs> well, my favourite it might, favorite it might be my favourite movie full stop right okay yeah. alright awesome okay yeah. Yeah. any particular reason or just just love it all there's so much sentimental value to it yeah. and I think I just love every aspect of it I still when I watch it now and I've watched it over 20 times surely and it still just stands up for me it's the older I get the funnier it gets and like you notice something new every time I just think it's yeah I think it's hilarious and really sad as well um mm. it's kind of those roller coaster of emotions I think so, yeah. yeah it is a sad ending, actually, because mm-hmm. you sort of think with the tone of the film, it's a bit up and down the tone. Uh, mm-hmm. Obviously, comedy and horror, but then it's a really sort of sad. There's, there's something about the way, it's the way it ends, though, and it, like, it ends and it's, you know, the shot of his body riddled with bullets, and then the credits just slam in oh, with the song. Oh, yeah, oh. and you're just kind of like, what the fuck? <laughs> you're kind of a bit like, oh, huh? <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> but again, I think that adds the kind of almost comedy element of it because it doesn't give you a minute to kind of be sad. It's kind of immediately throws this like pure banger at you. So. <laughs> yeah, it's a bit of a throwback to old school movies as well, where whenever the, the film ended, it just ended. There was no like, oh, this is what happens afterwards. Like you go back and watch a lot of those old movies from the 30s, 40s, 50s. Like the last scene, it just ended and the credits just came up and that was it. You know, there was no there was no bullshit. Kill the monster, no consequences. Exactly. Like, yeah. oh. <laughs> I know. Just going back to the, the makeup effects there by Rick Becker. This was the the first year, 1981 was the first year that they introduced the Academy Award for makeup. And yeah. Rick Becker fucking won it. So there you go. Uh, Rick yeah. Becker was the first ever winner of the Academy Award for uh, special makeup effects. And deservedly yeah. so. Deservedly mm-hmm. so. Um, but also, he didn't just do the makeup. He actually obviously performed as the wolf. Uh-huh. Uh, in many scenes, he was, you know, he was, he was, holding the wolf's head and you know you're supposed to be able to see him yeah in one of the there's, there's a scene well i think they fixed that maybe mm-hmm. in a lot of the new releases but there's a scene near the end at the piccadilly uh circus that whole chaotic sequence like, where so he mad. bites he bites the head off <laughs> and uh i seen a picture of a still from the set and you can see you can see him obviously 
and Landis says, well, the camera cuts, it's supposed to cut him off there. But I think in some of the old transfers, you actually do see the tiny bit of his arm. You see a wee bit of his arm and a wee bit of his beard. <coughs> yeah. Because yeah. again, Rick Becker is iconic for his his beardy look. Obviously. I love Vaughn. Do you ever, do you, do you follow him on Instagram? Oh yeah, man, yeah. And the stuff he puts out on Instagram when he does all like, it makes himself up. Uh-huh. To be like zombies and ghostly pirates and all sorts of things, and it is incredible. Could you imagine getting him to like do your makeup for Halloween? See, see if I had um, he's retired, he's sort of retired now. I don't think he mm-hmm. does any work in cinema at all now. But if I had one wish, I would love to go and visit his his cave, mm-hmm. that, which wow, I so. think he's actually closed down now. But it used to be opened where people could go and visit, and it's just like rows and rows of his stuff that he's worked on over the years and man that would be awesome like i'd love to just chat to him about all the films that he's worked on what a legend yeah so that monster design by rick becker is really awesome it'd be awesome if we had some sort of book that we could show it off in oh look at that I mean, like this book john landis's monsters and movies <laughs> i had no idea you had that danny did you not know that i happen to have a copy of this very book which that is I do believe you also have. Brand new information to us. <laughs> Where am I going? Well, let's go to page 46. If you turn to page 46 in your textbooks, <laughs> you will see the werewolf. <coughs> How much else? Werewolf. Yeah, here we go. American so, Marvel. We were talking about Rick Beck, some of the cool pictures of Rick Beck are in the, in the actual... Here we go. Yeah. The... Awesome. Awesome. Uh-huh. Incredible. Absolutely incredible. Yeah, awesome. Awesome fucking artwork at its finest there. But the, the whole thing with the whole transformation scene was that as you already know, uh, he wanted to make it look really painful. He wanted it to be a full body thing. He wanted it to be the first of its kind type thing where you saw you saw it in daylight as well. It wasn't in shadow and um, it was a full body thing that hadn't really been, been done before. He didn't want to do the Lon Cheney Jr you know, falling into the seat, just the time lapse, which is still amazing, don't get me wrong, but mm-hmm. he wanted to do something different, so uh, Rick Beggar was, was able to do it, because he's a fucking legend. That's it, this film does not hold back on showing you all the details, you know, it does, everything is lit up really well, so right. that you can see all those details. You get to see a wee bit of David Norton's arse, for the mm-hmm. ladies. A little, a little, a little bum bum. A little bum bum, yep. Talking about nudity on set, I was... Uh, Again, in my research, um, the shower scene apparently. Um, uh, what's her name? It's gone in here. Yes, she said that during the shower scene, um, the amount of male uh, crew members that suddenly appeared out of nowhere and made themselves very busy to be on set at that time because they actually had to build the shower. Um, because there wasn't actually that many showers in London at the time, apparently. So in the apartment, in the in the set they were in, they had to build the shower. And when they were, they had to try and regulate the heat of the water. So they were just like constantly trying to jig the heat that was coming down, you know, the heat of the water coming down on them. Um, so yeah, apparently that was a, a scene in itself for Dirty them boys, to get done. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Dirty boys. Coordinators. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. I know. Uh, or Jenny Agutter from the Railway Children, but that's uh, that scene was supposed to be longer. Apparently, there's supposed to be like a, a quite a prolonged sex scene, which they cut. Yeah, I, don't, I don't know why. Like probably because you could see all the crew men in the back. I'm all just sitting there. <laughs> I'm fixing the light. I know. I've got to fix this thing here. I know. Fair play. Fair play. It's already uh, quite long. Feels like. I know. Unnecessary, I would say. You don't yeah. Really... I suppose it was, it was the time. It was the uh, time. It was the eighties. You had to see a wee bit of boob. Yes. You know, we we daddy. You do see a bit of daddy, don't you? You see the daddy later in the porno. Uh, there's oh, wow, the daddies. Right. Man, I forgot. I actually see watching this time how funny that porno is. What's it called? Uh, see you next Wednesday or something. Yes. Wednesday. Yeah, and then what is it? It's when the fellow walks in and he's like, "I told you not to be at this," and <laughs> the guy's like. <laughs> Oh yeah, oh. sorry. Sorry, <laughs> wrong house. Killed me. There's like a phone call later on. Like, what did she even say? That like someone calls her and then things, and then again, it's just like, oh, I think you've got the wrong number, or something like that. I know it's so silly, so, so funny. It's what, and again, the fact that that's just ad, like they made that to go into it. I know. 
is so just like they did, there was no need for them to do that but it just adds so much to the humor of it mm-hmm. it, set, it sets the sort of time as well you know like mm-hmm. obviously those places well they still exist now i'm sure but they were a thing back then yeah sure even well the the prince charles theater in london was an old porno theater and is now uh yeah mm-hmm. it was an old porno theater and then now it's like a really popular sort of wee indie cinema yeah. Um, yeah. Very well respected. Mm-hmm. I'd love to go there. I why saw a screening here, of why didn't Batman. They call it, why didn't they call it the the Prince, Prince Edward? Albert. The Prince Edward <laughs> Theatre. If it was an old porn theatre and not the Prince Charles. It's not called an Al- a Prince Albert. I know, but I'm talking about Edward because he was a dirty bastard. Mm, oh. He likes to, you know. Anyway, we'll get away from the royal family. <laughs> like all, <laughs> anyway. the, just all the royal family. <laughs> just- <laughs> I would say it's, it's not Prince. That's not even Edward. It's An- Andrew. Isn't it? I was going to say, is it Andrew? Oh no, but he's 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 a diddler. Mm, he's a, he's a kiddie diddler. We don't. I know. I know. <laughs> the less said about him, the better. Yeah. yeah. Um, but yeah, we briefly spoke about the soundtrack. Oh. This maybe Kate, you were oh. saying that you used to listen to it all the time. Yeah. Oh, what a soundtrack! Like that's obviously, so like every song on the soundtrack has got something to do with the moon. Mm-hmm. And um, brilliant! I love that intro, "Blue Moon" by Bobby Vinton's unreal song. Beautiful, yeah. His establishing shots as well. Yeah. You think, ooh, this is gonna be a nice film. <laughs> I love this film, though. You yeah. get a lovely shot of the, the mirrors and all. Mm-hmm. And uh, what other songs is like? Credence is on there, "Bad Moon Rising" and uh, "Rising." I... Dance, obviously. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, I mean, obviously that was the first place I've heard all of these songs. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. Um, there's a couple then, of different versions of Blue Moon, isn't there? Three, a... yeah, because there's the first one, and then there's the one as he's transforming. Um, it is as he's transforming, isn't yeah, it? Sam yeah, Sam Cooke. Yeah. And then, obviously... The, the credits. Movie, the very, very end. So, yeah. three different moods. I do prefer the Bobby Vinton version to the Sam yeah. Cooke version. Yeah. I just, I, I like Sam Cooke, but I definitely prefer the Bobby Vinton version. But um, our old pal, Elmer Bernstein... Elmer Bernstein done did the soundtrack. Done did the score, and he got a wee bit of fucking. He should have. I know he definitely did a, a cue for the transformation scene, although he was told that he didn't need to do the cue because uh, obviously John Landis already had these songs in his head. But still, I kind of was like, ah, that'd be great to hear that over the him changing into the wolf. Uh, it's out there somewhere, I think. I don't know if it's the, the full version or whatever, but. Um, Oh, we love a bit of Elmer Bernstein. Like, he's made oh, yeah. it. Yep. I know. So, um, talking about the intro, that that mirrors, you know, the mirrors scenes, you know, legendary. Um, and then obviously the whole scene at the start when they're walking through with their backpacks, and then they go into the famous Lord Lamb. Mm-hmm. Like, mm-hmm. man, that that whole sequence is just so good. Do you know where it's filmed? I, I know that I know it's in Wales. Was the mm-hmm. was the Black, it's the Black Mountains in Wales? Yeah, yeah. and uh, the, the 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 exterior of the pub was a cottage, and then the interior was an actual pub somewhere else. I don't know if it was in the same area. Danny, do you know? I'm not sure about that one. Oh, come on! If anybody knows, I thought you were going to give me, drop some facts on me there. No, I just knew it was filmed in Wales, in the Black Mountains in Wales. That's as much as I learned in my in my research. <laughs> Your research. <laughs> But uh, that whole sequence in the Slaughtered Lambs, iconic. So good. Um, you get a couple of real classic British actors in there that, you know, you have Brian Glover and obviously Rick Mel, who just a legend, absolute legend. And there's a few other familiar faces in there that you see and loads of other things over the years. But brilliant scene, brilliant scene. And um, we get that classic line where they, they obviously tell tell the lads to be, beware beware the moon lads and stay off the mirrors and stick to the road and they don't and what happens to them they get raped by a wolf <laughs> <laughs> they get done diddly by a they big get mad dung wolf diddly by a big prince andrew wolf oh. um. <laughs> <laughs> big hairy prince andrew oh fuck oh, um, going in a direction <laughs> <laughs> oh, my, I love the, the the pub scene. What I really like about the pub scene is that it does it goes for that kind of traditional like out of town stranger thing, and everyone's kind of looking at them. But then instantly the mood is lightened when they start talking about the Alamo and the you know the, the 
one of the fellow one of the bar patrons is telling the joke about the Alamo, you know, for the Alamo and he yeah. throws the Mexican out the plane. Um, and again, it's just typical like British bar humor and stuff in that moment. Um, and then just how to bring the tension back, ask them about the, the pentagram on the wall. And that there, just that like the sudden shift, like the, the how quickly the mood shifts from being kind of hostile to friendly to hostile again mm -hmm. is absolutely mm -hmm. fantastic and I, I love that you know you do you kind of go into it thinking oh this is going to be the traditional like go out or pub Aye. thing but then it's kind of not and you're like oh relax but then all of a sudden the, the tension's back up again you're like oh fuck okay mm -hmm. um fantastic i i just I, and i love the set and i love like bar settings in any movie really but especially with the, like the likes of horror movies and stuff just those we kind of like local english bars um always a real nice thing to look at with the the old barmaid stand you know wiping the cup or you know cleaning the glasses down and stuff oh beautiful what will it be lads you know it's yeah. just yeah it's a it's a typical typical sort of set or location that you would have seen back then i'm sure they still exist to this day certain mm -hmm. places around the countryside but the pentagram is very um important because it's obviously foreshadowing what we're about to see because that was a throwback again to the wolfman um, and the original wolfman film whenever Lon Chaney gets bitten I think um, they see a pentagram on his I can't remember I think it's Bella Lugosi as, as the gypsy and he sees the pentagram on the hand and that's supposed to say that you know there's danger looming so it's a bit of a throwback to that there and kind of to that werewolf lore which is always nice because I always like when they go back to older films and try to we love that Danny we love when they go back to the older films yeah we throw back we throw back I know I heard or homage as I know. Like to say. homage homage, homage. homage. A, little homage. I know. a tribute <laughs> tribute <laughs> tribute <laughs> tribute <laughs> yeah, what do you love about the start of the film I just yeah everything like saying, oh, but oh. Like, I, I love when that kind of tone shifts again like you say and then it's but it's their fear that's palpable because they obviously don't want to be questioned on they, it's like they don't want to admit that anything's wrong and obviously you get the sense that this town is just has the secret but they don't want anyone to know about it um and I think yeah that's the real like I remember the first time watching thinking oh, what's gonna happen you know it's so mm -hmm. and then we get thrown out and then you know, they're just kind of walking around in the moors and they're, they're so exposed. Um, I just remember being so freaked out watching that. And then, you know, they're singing away and trying to keep, um, you know, keep positive when they realise they've got, a, they've kind of walked onto the moors. It's when David goes, oops. So <laughs> <they're it's>, like, <laughs> it is, they're completely exposed and it, it sort of yeah. reminded me of like whenever I was young and we used to go for drives down around the glens. And like we'd park the car somewhere and we'd just randomly walk and you'd just be walking through these big hills and you're like, where the fuck are we? Like, but it's okay. it's crazy. But we forgot you mentioned that the, one of the very first scenes is them um, uh, on the back of the, the truck with the lambs, <laughs> isn't it? Goodbye. The lambs. Goodbye, ladies. I know. <laughs> and it's like, that's completely foreshadowing. It's like they're there with the lambs and it's, you know, obviously something bad's going to happen. Yeah. Um, lambs to slaughter. Oh, I know. Oh, the slaughtered <laughs> lamb. Mm -hmm. Exactly. But it's, I yeah I really like that bit. It's the bit when you kind of because you don't really sort of know what's going on. But as you say, the the tension that's built up by the villagers then even when they leave and they're like, oh, we better go out after them. We'll be done for murder. And you're kind of like, why would they be done for murder? And then we get the howl, and you're just like, oh, oh yeah. <laughs> Aye, this beat this beast exists. They know it exists, and they've tried their best to protect these lads, but they've sent them off basically. They ask too many questions. To their death, exactly, you know. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, nosy Americans. You know, yeah. I just love Brian Glover. Beware the moon, lads. I just yeah. love these classes. Uh, he's gonna help us. <laughs> Hello. But before we get into some of our favorite scenes and stuff, um we briefly spoke about a sequel, which was not the greatest sequel. It's a bit more uh, it's quite serious, isn't it? There's not a lot of humor mm -hmm. that I remember. Mm -hmm. Maybe I'm not remembering it well, but um quite different in tone but there was also supposed to be a remake which i am completely dead against as always not a big fan of remakes unless they do something very different with it but fucking max landis a few years ago who's john's son who um is a bit of a dick 
was supposed to be remaking this, and then all that shit came out. I don't know if you know about this, but all that shit came out about him online that he was um, an abuser and stuff happened. I don't know if it's true or not. But anyway, he went away for a while. I think he stayed away, which is not the the worst thing to happen. And your man who created Walking Dead was supposed to be linked with the remake, Robert Kirkman. Uh, he he created the Walking Dead, so mm, not happy about a remake. I wouldn't want to see a remake. Maybe uh, like another sequel or an origin. Maybe a sort of you know where did the original werewolf that attacked um, David and that where did it come from? Uh, because again, the, the thing that I think is quite interesting is they talk about like yes, for all they have to have the kind of tributes and homages to the vampire or vampire uh, werewolf movies that came before. There's a lot of kind of interesting notions about the werewolf kind of how it carries on so yes you get tainted by being bitten but those you kill Mm -hmm. stay in this like ghost limbo but also still like decompose and suffer in that and i thought that was a really interesting thing to kind of come out of it because again i'm not i don't think that's been mentioned in any any other werewolf movie or lore and and there's no mention of like silver bullets to defeat them they can Mm -hmm. just be killed with an ordinary bullet um you know, so there's kind of a lot, it's sort of, yes, there's the cinematic homages, but in terms of how werewolves work, um, bar being bit by one to become one, the idea is if you become a part of that werewolf bloodline, you have to die in order for the the spirits of those you've killed to move on as well. Mm-hmm. I was like, that's a really interesting notion. It's not something that's really explored too much. It's just, um, it's just as mate being like, kill yourself. Mm-hmm. Yeah. kill yourself so that i can rest in peace mm-hmm. you know uh, he, he he has to basically die and finish that line for the, the other guys to to go in peace essentially to the other realm or whatever it's called but um that's interesting yeah i didn't really think about that too much danny no i'd like to that's something i, I would like to hear more about that i'd like to know more of this notion of that because it, it must be you know obviously because uh jack 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 Jack. Jack. Jack, Jack, because Jack is still there, but David didn't kill Jack. So does that mean that every person who has been victim to this this werewolf line is still kind of like lingering around, decomposing and suffering in the background? Because is there one point where Jack says that he's the final werewolf in the line and he has to mm-hmm. then die? That's why he's got to kill himself. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. He says that at the start when he when he sees him in the hospital. Yeah. He says, you know, you have to we ha- you have to end the werewolf line. You have to kill yourself. And David's like, no, I'm imagining this. I'm going crazy. This is a terrible dream I'm having. Yeah. We yeah. have some dreams in that well, the dreams. <laughs> oh my goodness. Let's talk about the dreams. I was just dreams gonna get go, I was gonna go on to the dreams uh next. The dreams are a massive part of this and uh, dreams feature this guy right here. Yes. They do, yes. <laughs> <laughs> I know. His dreams are fucking mental, but they're really entertaining and quite an important part of the story. Because they, you, you could think about it sort of being, oh, it's just sort of throwaway scenes just for entertainment purposes, but it's part of his transformation. And he's, you know, he thinks that he's losing his mind, but he's, you know, obviously going through the motions here and he's, you know, he's having these crazy fucking nightmares. I, w- I wouldn't even say they're dreams. They're nightmares. Mm-hmm. But yeah, Kermit and... Uh, Obviously, the, the Nazi zombies, the, the Nazi zombie werewolves are just like, where the fuck did they come from? Like, they must have just had surplus Nazi uniforms and been like, throw them on them, stick them on there. Go for it. Well, uh, funny enough, John, John Landis was saying that um, when he was talk, thinking about the dreams, um, he wanted to obviously the character is, is a Jewish American, so it would be like if you were having nightmares. Uh, what would you think about what what were the stories that you were told when you were younger? You know, what were the kind of things that hummed at you when you were a child? It was your probably your parents and your grandparents telling you about their history and stuff. So that would kind of the Nazis would be one of the things that would maybe hunt at him as a child. So, but that scene where he's just like in there with his parents and it's just like a nice American home and he's making dinner or something, isn't he? And they're watching. He's TV. doing. He's like doing work or something at the dinner table, and the two younger ones are watching the Muppets, and Mum's preparing dinner, and Dad, I think, sitting reading a book and smoking or something. Yeah, I never actually put that together though, because there's a point 
at, when he first goes to the hospital and the two nurses are talking <laughs> and one of them's like he's I Jewish checked. I yeah. checked and you're kind of like what a fucking weird Hello. thing to say <laughs> this bar- like the hospital's boundaries are I know like she says yeah. that the nurse is like yeah sure come back to my house like I know it's, really- it was the 80s Kate it was a different time. There was no rules back then. <laughs> I love, you know who my favourite uh, hospital employee um, in this movie is? You know the wee porter that brings him his breakfast? <laughs> and he's like, yeah. telling him, you have orange juice and some uh-huh. toast and some bacon and I'll come back later for the dishes. I'd yeah. be like, you're great. You're the, you're what that hospital needs. And Definitely. <laughs> Absolutely, man. Um, but when I was reading some, uh, or watching some videos of John Lannis talking about the dreams and stuff, the whole dreams idea was inspired by um, a filmmaker called Adrian Brunel, who a lot of his films, or one of Landis's favourite films, was directed by him. And apparently Brunel's films, uh, he had a lot of dream sequences. And he, he there was this particular film that he was talking about, and I can't remember the name of it. It was like uh, a lot of characters were waking up from dreams. And then the next scene would be them waking up from the dream that they just had. So it was like dreams within dreams. And he wanted to play with it, play with that. And there's a scene in, in this where just after the Nazi zombies where he wakes up and then she goes to the curtain and it's a dream within a dream type thing and he wakes up again. So I always, I like that concept. I think it's funny when she goes to open the curtains being like, oh, you've just had a dream and over and the Nazi thing. But, and it makes like a howling it's it's chip noise. noise. It's, it's a weird like... sound design and it's like a real, yeah, it's like a real weird, yeah, it's like a chimp actually, yeah. It's a chimp. It's, uh, I'm pretty sure because Landis said, the werewolf noises aren't just like wolf howls. I think it's wolf, lion, some sort of primate, and uh, locomotives are all the kind of noises jumbled together to make the different kind of wolf or werewolf noises throughout the film. Because mm-hmm. he wanted people to kind of, when they heard the sound, they didn't, he didn't want them to just think, oh, that's a wolf howl. Okay. He wanted them to be a bit more like, what's that? Like, it, it, there's something more to this than just... A wolf howl. It's a bit more, uh, yeah. Mon- yeah, a bit more monstery than just a, a natural noise. Yeah, I like unnatural. Like it's it wouldn't exist in the real world type thing. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, um, the hospital scenes are funny, but and then the the older doctor's kind of funny and weird as well. Yeah, uh, he's just bizarre. And then also we get the cameo from Frank Oz, mm-hmm. um, of course, who's amazing. <laughs> love Frank everything. Oz. Absolutely love. Frank Oz so much and even his like directorial stuff I, I still hold a very special place in my heart for like Indian in the Cupboard and Little Shop of, or um yeah not Little yeah it was Little Shop of Horrors he directed wasn't it I think so, I think so eh? yeah yeah he directed Little Shop of Horrors so yeah I, I love Frank Oz and all his shapes and forms whether it's Yoda Miss Piggy or in this as a lawyer <laughs> is he like he's a uh, consulate? Does he work for the US consulate? Uh, yes, yeah. He's like a, yeah. Yeah. He should have worked for that job, but. Mm-hmm. I don't know. He's an American representative. He's, he's a US ambassador. Yeah, he works for the embassy, yeah. That's yeah, it. Yeah, embassy, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <Yep>. Words. <laughs> <laughs> So, uh, <laughs> but it's because it's you get that there scene and then you get the dream after with the Muppets playing and Miss Piggy's yeah. in it and you're just like it's back to back Frank Oz it's it's supposed to be pr- kind of surreal I think as well mm-hmm. you know like a kind of a weird surreal thing for the audience as well yep. um, but we'll talk about our favourite scenes because you know we've mentioned a few throughout this chat but uh, I love the intro I love all the slaughter lamb stuff but the zoo scene's quite funny oh my god <laughs> The bit with the balloon Hello, are you absolutely going? killed me. I'm I'm a balloon thief. Why would a balloon thief want to give me two pounds? Well, let me tell you. It just comes out and grabs it. And you can see the wee boys trying not to laugh. I, know. I think that's what makes it even funnier because you're like, he's definitely not acting like he is trying to hold his shit together. But this negative merit. It's just when the wee boy goes up to his ma or whoever it is, he's like, a naked American man just stole my balloons. And she's like, what? <laughs> <laughs> Shut up, you! Yeah, exactly. Just gonna smack him or something. You want me? <laughs> you want me? I know it's uh, that's a great scene. Just to, again, a wee bit of butt oh, for the ladies, you know. A little bum bum, a little bum bum for the the women out there. Uh, <laughs> and uh, but yeah, it must have been weird to film that, like, because it's just weird. Just running through <laughs> London Zoo. I know it's just bizarre, but. <laughs> 
Yeah, fair play to him. Um, Kate, what about your favourite scenes? I think um, I, I love the first, I mean, from the first transformation um, to, I, I love the part where his kind of first bunch of murders, the bit where he's following the guy through the, the underground station is yes. so good. Um, yeah, I think that was probably the bit that scared me the most watching it I think that whole part from him transforming to that is uh and then you just he wakes up in the zoo and then it's hilarious it's just mm -hmm. that that tone change is so mm -hmm. exhausting I think to watch mm -hmm. but yeah I think that that pursuit um or even the, the couple who are going to the dinner party I just think yeah I think that might be my favorite my favorite scenes mm -hmm. I film. love yeah I love the underground I've actually completely forgot about that um <laughs> but yeah the, just the aesthetic of the tube station and yeah I just I love that whole aesthetic of the underground and like we've all been in the underground and the way that the, the guy with the briefcase as he's running he sort of slips like yeah. all those floors are always slippy and they're dirty and stinking and you know the kind of oval or the round shape mm -hmm. to the tunnel and whenever he eventually jumps over and he goes up the escalator and he falls obviously and you get that lovely shot from the top of the escalator and you right. just see the wolf creeping in it's, it's yeah, the fantastic. first time you sort of see how big it is and it is really really creepy yeah that's probably the scariest part. Our mate Bib Fortuna, Michael Carter played that. He was the inside the wall. Or no, no, he, he's he's the, the fella. He's the businessman, yeah. Oh. Michael Carter, who plays Bib Fortuna in Return of the Jedi. So I did not know that. There you go. There facts. You go. Dropping them facts. Dropping um, the info. We love the end as well. I think it's absolute utter chaos. Where yeah, yeah, drive it into each other, and <laughs> that's what Landis loves a car crash, like, he absolutely yeah. loves crashing cars. Like, I mean, there's the was it, I think Blues Brothers did hold the record for the most crashed mm -hmm. cars in a single movie. Um, he just, he just loves automobile destruction, I know. Uh -huh. We bit unnecessary in Blues Brothers, there's quite a lot of it. <laughs> I love it though. I see that whole bit when they're all just like flying into each other, they're just all flying up that ramp into each other, fantastic. Um, the the porno is great. The, the cinema is great, and because the, there's the two the other two dead people as well. It's there's three there's the there's the fella the businessman he kills the couple. I love it when the couple kind of appear. They're just like, it's the couple, yeah. That's what and then the three the three hobos as yeah. well. Oh yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah, the um, uh huh. So they're all like chatting to him, and they're all kind of like um, Jack's trying to just convince him to kill himself again, basically. Um, but he's trying to be do it in like a friendly way. But all the others are just like, no, do it like, no, just fucking kill yourself. Like you did this to us. Just hurry up. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um. But yeah, what again? What a fantastic scene because you got obviously the humor of the of the see you next Wednesday movie playing, uh, and then you've got all these people who are like grotesque and you know have been slashed and bitten torn apart and blood oozing from them. skin and, hanging off them and stuff it's really yeah cool. but even Seriously. what they're saying like if, if there wasn't that kind of humor in the background of what's being said on the screen like they're being really awful like they're just, they're trying to pressure this man into killing himself and he kind of yes you can kind of understand because he killed them and he's a werewolf he's a monster mm -hmm. um, but at the same time like it's still his life and it's quite a, you know, it's a, it's a pressurizing moment. And then suddenly you have that moment where he snaps and turns. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, it's just what, yeah, what a fantastic That's, chaotic ending. Is that the first time you see the face, like properly? Like kind the, of front on the face of the wolf? Because there's not the policeman comes in. Yeah. And then yeah. he like turns. Oh, yes. And then it's when he's eaten. Yeah. The, the, the other yeah. patron. Yeah. And then obviously the whole chaotic scenes afterwards in Piccadilly Circus happen, but they had to film that late at night. Obviously, <laughs> they, couldn't film, they couldn't film it at like seven p.m. They had to film it like at one a.m. in the morning or something over two nights, and um, they weren't originally allowed to do it. So that scene may not have ever happened, but Landis kept pressing and pressing and the and they were the, apparently that was the first film in like fifteen years it was allowed to film like extended scenes in Piccadilly Circus. So I don't really know why. I don't know why, but that's... Probably just, again, a bit, uh, probably the hassle of shutting the whole place down. Because uh, even at that time, a night in London, 
I dare say it would still cause issues mm-hmm. for traffic and stuff. Yeah. Um, and I dare say there's probably a lot that, you know, the I dare, the London Metropolitan Police probably had to be involved to they did, make yeah. sure there was no drunks hanging about. I was reading about the film. It took, it was a 55 day shooting schedule um, and it shot. So it shot in the 55 days and then released in the same year it was made. Mm-hmm. Which I, that's, you know, I think that's crazy for, for a film to be able to do something like that, sh- to be shot and released in the same Yeah, year. They, they, they filmed it uh, in March, the end of March, April time, because obviously they, he wanted it to be quite dull, uh-huh. you know, because it would affect the tone of the movie. And, you know, England's dull most times anyway. But he wanted to film it in March and April. I think it was released around the end, of, the end of August, which is like a really quick turnaround. Maybe it was slightly after that, but even still... Really quick fucking turnaround for, you know, I know it's a short movie, but, you know, when you think about the amount of shots that's in it, especially with all the special effects and, yeah. you know, all the kind of cloak and dagger stuff that they had to do with this film, that would have been a fairly, um, you know, dodgy editing process that they'd had to go through. But, you know, it worked out amazing in the end. So it's the editing's incredible. And some of the shots, you know, it's very, it's very snappy and it's very quick. And I think, yeah, just fantastic. And, you know, as yeah it's just like every, like you know someone's head flying off and people screaming and stuff like that editing must have been insane mm-hmm. at the end there's a great there's a great uh scene where isn't there there's a car that cr- crushes a man yeah and yeah, was, the policeman yeah. gets yeah. oh yeah there's a couple of people crushed there's one where the, there's a guy he's walking and uh, a, a car comes and crushes him that was john landis um, Obviously, he didn't do the actual stunt. You know, it was whoever it was the stunt man that did the stunt. But I think for a part of that scene, like he <laughs> stepped in to do it, or he did, he was part of that sequence anyway. He was definitely in the sequence because he did an Alfred Hitchcock and <laughs> I walked out into the scene. Love it. Exactly. But the thing is, you know, John Landis, he he does love over the top stunts, and you know, he had that yeah. incident that happened on the Twilight Zone movie where. The actor Vic Morrow died, and there was two two children died as well. Children, they were killed yeah. by a helicopter, weren't they? Uh-huh. And like that was obviously insanely traumatic. And he almost went to prison for that, but he he got off. So I know, think Spielberg uh, fell out with him over that. I don't think I, Spielberg ever spoke to him again. After really? That. I think so. There was a thing I read somewhere that or it took a very very long time for him to work, want to work or even speak to him again after that. Yeah, because he, he definitely broke some rules. Obviously, he broke some rules, but um, whenever I had watched the doc, there's a documentary called Curse Films on Shudder, mm-hmm. and there's an episode completely dedicated to the, to that incident. And um, he doesn't take part in part in the, the interviews, obviously, but they show they actually show it. Oh, yeah, oh. So you see it. It's not the nicest thing, although you don't see anything graphic, but you do see the helicopter coming down and and hitting the people, but you don't actually see anything graphic as such but still pretty traumatic but um Gosh. yeah he definitely broke some rules and i think he was very lucky to get away with it he was very lucky that nobody got injured in that fucking piccadilly circus I know. you say Kate, everyone people were fucking flying everywhere it was madness it's crazy well, and, stuff. and then yeah people wedge between cars and i know oh it's great <laughs> I think there is like uh at the end during the end credits there's a, an extensive stump person list mm-hmm. oh okay mm-hmm. Uh, and then there was like um what was it they were saying there's a couple of funny things at the end of the credits there's something where they're like the lycanthrope film society would like to congratulate princess diana and prince charles on their wedding because they just got married i think <laughs> that same year i think i think i'm pretty sure it was 1981 they got married or 1980 so uh but it, it was like a funny credit in the end and then it was something like no no werewolves were harmed in the making of this film or something like that are you part of the society kate Oh, I. Of course. I'm the um, Bristol uh, chapter president, uh, actually. <laughs> here's my card. <laughs> my my credentials. <laughs> well, we we've spoken about the transformation scene a little bit. Uh, we'll talk about it a little bit more before we head off here because it's one of the greatest okay. scenes ever in horror cinema. Uh, I love the fact that it's it's just filmed in a, a really small living room as well, and it's. You know, lights are on. It's not as if it's in the dark. You see everything, and like it still holds up today. And my favorite part of it is whenever he's on the ground and his whole body's, you know, and he's obviously under the suit or whatever, as we heads poking up. Like that's just still looks amazing today. But um, if you get a chance to check out Rick Becker, um, 
talking about it, he sort of goes through the process of how he did it all. And it's so fascinating to hear him talk about the process of it and how much work went into I'll it. Just show it again, just there because you you've, you've mentioned That's it. it. That's the one, yeah. Yeah, that's the exact moment. So they built they built like a thing up and they put the body on it and then they had him come up at the top. But it looks really, really good still today. It's I incredible. I get goosebumps watching it. I, I think know. it's so good. And just how viscerally in pain he is yeah. as well, I think. Just like the start when he's absolutely sweating out and you know, ripping his shirt off and you just, it's so believable. Do, it's do, you, do you know what it is as well? It's the fact that he's just reading a paper or a book or something. It's not as if it's like, it's oh, I feel sick. Or, and it's like, he just literally goes, oh, Jesus Christ. Yeah. And he's pure sweating and he gets up and he starts screaming. And it's just that weird sort of like, there is no build up to it. It just happens. Clicks, yeah. yeah. And it's like where he's, uh, he apologises for calling Jack a meatloaf, is it? Oh, yeah. <laughs> so, so, so. <laughs> meatloaf. Incredible. I love that. It's the, yeah, he just starts burning up and he's tearing his clothes off. And then as you say, the whole like hair growing out, but that's actually reversed footage of hair being pulled through synthetic skin. And it the... was fine. Kind of the spine bumps that spine. I always really remember that as well. So that's like done with um so they were using like air pumps. So they were using yeah. syringes of air to push the spinal column, like all the wee bits were set up to those when they pushed that, it caused it to rise up below a synthetic skin layer. And that's how they got the effect of like all the bits and pieces like popping up through the skin absolutely incredible and the fact that they were able to kind of keep it all contained and just shoot it again just talking about the editing of it how they've managed to kind of shoot it all so that we still get like nice close-ups of bits and pieces like the hair growing and the the spine coming through and then the wides of the full body are moving and writhing and the you know the claws growing out and stuff it's that, oh. it's that snout as well Mm-hmm. Yeah. Like that, that blew me away and how did they do that like that's obviously i know how they did yeah, it but still hands and feet like just yeah. growing. it's oh it stuck with me like that's probably the one thing i can remember from the first time i watched it is that that transformation scene will stick with you from first view yeah, absolutely. um you know there's so many great wee moments that you kind of forget about but when you watch it again you're like oh yeah fucking the muppets were in it and yeah. oh yeah fucking um nazi zombie werewolves and stuff but this it, it just it, you'll never forget this transformation never ever and even before that way before the transformation scene but whenever he has that dream where he's in the forest and he's lying in the bed and you see that blue face with the yellow contacts that mm-hmm. scared the shit out of me more even i think than the transformation it's just because it just it flashes yeah. it's such a it's a real quick moment you almost kind of go fuck like did Woo! that just happen <laughs> um and again love Fine, yeah it's just and again you get it with the uh, thriller then you get those the contacts which... <laughs> right we're nearly at the end here danny what's the blue hue count like oh <laughs> quite a bit of blue there's some hue. nice lovely blue hues um nice. especially the more the the moors have some lovely blue hues um and yeah basically any scene at night and that's the thing this film is lit up really lovely um, you know, I don't think they're for a werewolfy movie. It's not too dark. I think with a lot of other oh, yeah. kind of werewolfy movies, it's normally quite dark and dingy, and they sort of keep to the stat the shadows until they're ready to strike. Whereas this movie, it's just like no, when lots we daylight, s- yeah, mm-hmm. lots yeah. of daylight or lots of like really open. You know, you've got like we said before, you've got the light of the living room, and down in the subway, we've got the fluorescent uh, lighting down there. Um, it's fun, yeah, fantastically lit, and uh, then we do have to go outside into the night. We get some lovely blue hues. Blue hues. <laughs> Hello. Um, such a great movie. Uh, you, Kate, you said it's one of your favorite movies. It's definitely up there in one of mine. It's probably my favorite werewolf movie. And Danny, you, I know it's one of your favorite werewolf movies as well. Oh yes, oh yes. definitely, <laughs> definitely. So very happy we got a chance to talk about American Werewolf in London. Mm-hmm. Um. Kate, thanks for coming on again. This Thank is our you. second time that you've been on. We'll get you on for something in next season. Um, something vampire vampire Or do you yes. have... Yes, we be love a good vampire. Mm-hmm. Do you have any requests? Is there anything you would like to join us on for next season? Oh, oh, a film I was obsessed with when I was younger. I haven't watched it, though, since um, Shadow of the Vampire. 
Oh, I'm not in the year, so I don't know how. Yes. How well it's uh, how, how much I'll enjoy it, but I, I mean, I was obsessed with it. Yes. It's one of those ones I just kept watching because I was obsessed with it. Yes. There is a like shout. Request. John Malkovich playing. Yes, that's yes. <laughs> that's that's a shout. No, hundred percent. Um, Willem yeah. Dafoe. Yeah, that's my my request. That's there you go. Well, there you have it, guys. We have uh, one four. Down. Mm-hmm. We do, mm-hmm. and we'll get there eventually. I don't know what episode it'll drop, so you'll have to check mm-hmm. out on our Twitter and our Instagram oh, the at the Fright Club NI. Danny, go for it. <gasps> Remember to like, comment, and subscribe, and hit that bell icon. And Kate, would you like to drop in any of your socials or anything? Yes, go for it. Yeah, what is my my Twitter handle? It's uh, I can't remember. My uh, isn't it isn't it at Muscular Museum? No. I think so. <laughs> <laughs> we will we will tag Kate. Kate in, doesn't uh, give a fuck about her Twitter handle. Yeah. So yeah, yeah. Kate yeah. Her Twitter handle in like twelve years. <laughs> I, don't know. Uh, I think it's at Muscular Museum. Might be spiral static. I can't remember. Yeah. Oh, spiral! Oh, no, I think that's. Oh, yeah, that rings a bell. I say spiral. Yeah. yeah. We'll tag you in. Uh, we will. We'll tag stuff. you in our. We'll post. Kate Cannon and that. Yeah. You'll find you'll, me. You'll you'll find the our resident lycanthrope and ginger. Our tweets. Hello. Yeah. Yes, but yes, please like and subscribe. Oh, yeah. Like and Hello. like and subscribe. Like and subscribe. And tell all your horror peeps about us. And this is the finale of season three, so we'll be taking a break now, and we'll be back in about four weeks for another season of Monday Night Frights. We might drop a wee bonus episode in there if we can be bothered doing a bonus episode. We'll see. We'll see what happens. We'll see. We'll what see. We might do like a wee Q and A, ask us anything type thing. We're not sure. We'll see how it goes. <laughs> <laughs> if anybody asks us questions, maybe, and if we don't get any questions, then fuck it, we're not doing it. So <laughs> ask us things. <laughs> So anyway, until four weeks. We'll say about four weeks, yeah, and then we'll drop season four, four. Uh, where we shall be. We'll, we'll give them a few hints. So we'll be uh, we'll be revisiting the Treehouse of Horror. Obviously, we shall go back down to Elm Street. Mm-hmm. Standard. We are going to battle with the armies of darkness. Oh, we are. Uh-huh. <laughs> and and we'll also. Visit vampires in shadows. In shadows, yes, we oh. will. Yeah. And we shall be joined by by Kate. The Kate. Well, we, ginger. Well, we go to see the uh, Willem de Friend. Yay! Willem, <laughs> Willem, Willem de Friend. Yes, definitely looking forward to that episode. Um, but yeah, guys, uh, four weeks we'll be back. Until then, stay safe. Take care. Bye. Bye. Bye.